Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Dan Cardalicchio. want to welcome you to another segment of Destination Health Podcast, Finding Function in a Dysfunctional World. And we are powered by the Suburban Wellness Group. And I want to welcome back, want to welcome back, Katie Kimball. Katie, how are you today? Doing great, Dan. Let's let's talk about some healthy stuff, right? Yeah, let's talk about some healthy stuff. And we had Katie on a little while ago, and she's coming back, and we decided to do a live. We want to do another live. We want to help the we want to show how we can teach the kids how to cook healthy, right? And that's going to be exciting. We just got like we were saying before, between hockey and baseball, pole vaulting, um, music lessons, and things of that nature. We have to find the time. But Katie is a mom, a teacher, speaker, writer, background as a teacher. So she likes to explain things and she explains things very nicely. Certification in stress mastery education. Over 2,500 pack lunches. That's a lot of lunches. All right. An entire family where everybody, you know, you and your husband are working from home. The kids are home. You eat well and you eat together and you have seven cookbooks and you teach kids how to cook. So you're pretty busy like we are here. That about sums it up. <laughs> right? You're 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 definitely very 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 busy. So before we start, you see you I've read where you talk about your husband. He had some health conditions. I don't think we got into this in our last conversation, did we? No, I don't think so. No. So tell me what happened with your husband and what were his health conditions and how did you help him out with cooking? Yeah, when he was 19, our second year in college, I think, um, he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. chronic autoimmune disease. And so for, for him, college was sort of a cycle of trying a drug. It would work for a little bit and mm -hmm. then it wouldn't work very well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with Crohn's disease, like the worst part about that is every time you eat, you just feel like crud. Okay. afterward and the eating should be fun and you know you're at college and eating should be like social and and there was that trepidation always like oh am I gonna hurt right. afterward um and I remember I think the lowest point I had made for him a, a birthday meal of like all his favorites including homemade lasagna so and, you know you think about like <laughs> the gluten and the dairy and you know the sugar and the desserts um and we you know we were supposed to enjoy an evening watching his favorite Christmas movie but that didn't happen. I had to take him home. And he he has a vision of just like leaning back in my van because that was really cool. I drove a van <laughs> as a 20 year old. <laughs> Super cool. Um, and just like he can still see like turning this one corner, like me taking him back to his dorm because he just was in so much pain. Um, and actually two days after college graduation, he had to go into surgery. They barely let him graduate to get intestine removed. So he's you oh know, my goodness. 20, 22 years old. He's got 12 inches of his ilium taken out. And after that surgery, the surgeon, you know, discharged him and said, you know, have like, good luck. You're looking fine. I'll see you back in seven years. That, that was his, that was his prognosis because that's about the average. Once you get intestine cut out, Crohn's is chronic. It comes back at the same position, inflaming your intestine and, and you get more out seven years later. And we were like, ouch, I know, ouch. I know. Talk about a positive guy. Ouch. <laughs> um, really exciting. So, so that was, you know, that was what we had heading into marriage. Mm -hmm. And after seven years, actually at the seven year mark was when we sat in the doctor's office for the first time talking about medication. So he had mm -hmm. seven years without medication and, you know, the side effects of, of these medications for autoimmune diseases are pretty severe. You know, there's steroids or they're like injections and fusions, like all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And we just, we just said, not yet. Like he wasn't really experiencing symptoms um, except for one time. And he, he experienced like two months of diarrhea and we're like, Oh no, it's back. And the right. doctors couldn't do anything for him. And his prescription anti-diarrheals like did not touch it. And I had mm -hmm. like the providential opportunity to hear Jordan Rubin speak. Can you recognize mm -hmm. that name? He's the author of the mm -hmm. maker's diet. Mm -hmm. He himself nearly died from Crohn's disease. I heard him speak. I came home and I walked in the door and I said, Chris, starting tomorrow, you're not eating dairy grains, legumes, or sugar. And he was like, Welcome home. <laughs> he had our two-year-old there. He's like, I'm glad I glad I let you go up to oh, that talk. What? <laughs> oh, 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 hi. <laughs> yeah. He was like, what? So we had no idea what we we're doing. I had no idea how to cook grain-free. I like barely knew what a legume was at that point. Right. But we just we just jumped in. 
And right. within two days, his diary was gone. He had the best digestion of his life. Really? Two days. I like called up his primary care doctor and I was like, you got to hear this. I'm like, this is what we did. Like, you got to tell everybody. And the nurse was like, yes, thank you. I'll make a note in his chart that his diarrhea is gone. And I'm like, nobody no, cares. That nobody, we, right. Nobody cares. It was such a, I mean, it was just such a defining moment in me understanding that doctors right. in modern medicine did not have our back. No, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm with you on that. Oh my goodness. I'm a doctor. <laughs> oh no, 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 but, but I'm a different type of doctor. No, you're not, you're not that kind of doctor. Um, well, fast forward to the, to the end of the story because there is an end. He, he has never had to go back to see the surgeon. Um, and in fact, you know, the last quote surgery he had was the, the colonoscopy when you have a, mm -hmm. an autoimmune disease in your intestines, you have mm -hmm. to get colonoscopies much more regularly than the normal population mm -hmm. every five years. Of course, we were like at the 10 year mark, like, oh, we should probably do that. Um, he's never, ever been on a prescription medication for the Crohn's disease since he was, you know, 20, since he had the intestine removed. Mm -hmm. And at his last colonoscopy, that doctor came out and said, you know, I'll see you in 10 years because I see no sign of Crohn's. Wow. He didn't even see it. So it's been taken off his chart, a chronic disease reversed. Totally reversed. And you used nutritional food to, to take care of this end. What happens a lot with autoimmune conditions, it's related to your gut. Oh yeah. Right. It is, it is, it is directly related to your gut and with your husband having Crohn's disease, it's right there. It's related to your gut. So we got a bunch of people watching us. If you have any questions for Katie or I put them in the comments section and let's see if we can answer them because you know what happened to me is that not too long ago, I had a physical my uh, partner is an integrative MD and she grabbed me. She said, you haven't had a physical in, in such a long time. And I said, eh, I'm all right. Don't worry about it. You know, and she's like, no, let's do the physical. We did some blood work. My platelets were non-existent and, and it was non-existent, my platelets. And so she called me up and she's like, oh my goodness, leukemia. I said, I don't think so. But let's, you know, let me, you know, let's get to the office and, you know, I'm traveling, I'm, a, I'm traveling to the office. We did, we did some further testing because I have an autoimmune condition. I have thrombocytopenia mm -hmm. where I have enzymes that are destroying my platelets. But I went on a, 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 an intestinal permeability protocol and now it's raising it up. And, you know, during that time, the office, you know, we're trying to build it even more and we're trying to help more people. And there's a lot of stress that's involved. And you always go for the sugar. You always go for the sugar. You always go for the sweeteners. And I'm human too. And I did that, Katie. So let's talk about this sugar. <laughs> oh, geez. Tell us you. about sugar. Why is this bad? Why should people never, ever decide to binge and get addicted to sugar? Well, I don't think anyone decides to get addicted to sugar, first of all, right? Like we, mm -hmm. we don't walk into life saying, I'm going to saddle myself with something that will hurt me. Um, but, but sugar is awful tempting. It is. It's awful tempting. Um, and again, let's preface this by saying I'm not a nutritionist. I don't have degrees, but I do read a lot, you know? And so, so I come at this from an educator point of view, right? Where, where as absolutely. An well, you got the, you got the kitchen stewardship. So when you're making yeah. foods, you're making sure that it's healthy as opposed to adding different ingredients, such as sugar that may be harmful and deleterious to our health. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sugar is, it's just a no brainer, right? Like there's, there's literally nothing good about it. And there are so many bad things, right? Obviously you're going to cause blood sugar issues. You're going to release more insulin. And, and I feel like, I feel like insulin is like a, um, it's a finite source, right? Like the more, the more we, we cause our body to like create insulin and spike and crash, mm -hmm. the closer we're going to get to being insulin resistant and then diabetic and then so on and so forth. Um, obviously, I mean, the worst thing, especially when you're talking kids, pe people say, cause I work with, with kids, you know, we teach kids to cook and people are always like, well, Katie, like everything in moderation. And they'll say, my, right. my kid's not heavy. Like it's fine. And, and that's the thing. Like sometimes we equate weight with health. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's dangerous for a lot of reasons, you know, some it people are is. heavy because of their genetics and some people are really thin, but they're really sick inside. That's right. Um, and sugar for sure with kids, it is for sure taking the place of, it is displacing something the kids need. 
Right. You know, the kids can only eat so much. And so if you're, if you're putting nothing in a huge, huge box of empty calories in there, there's something, there's some fruits or some vegetables or some protein or some minerals that they are not eating. Um, and so right. that's, that's huge. And, you know, you just mentioned the gut, like sugar feeds all the bad guys. Feeds all it feeds all that, it feeds all that bad bacteria that's in that gut and it, and it creates, and it creates. And one of the reasons why I brought this up, Katie, is because interestingly, you know, enough that I went through my son's backpack today okay. because he needed me to, you know, get a couple of things out. He got up a little late this morning. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Chocolate bars and, and lollipops and so forth and so on. And he had walked into his room and I was standing there with like bags, empty bags. And I said to him, buddy, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? And I said, boy, you have a sweet tooth. Like I did when I was younger, you got to stop that. Right. And you can't, you can't do that because if they, if they eat this stuff, right. And if they're eating this stuff, and if you're overweight as a child, you have a more of a propensity to be overweight as an adult. Now, it could be deleterious, it could be bad. And as you said, and I agree, you could be overweight, but if you if we run a CBC and a smack and and we do a food sensitivity test and a leak and, and leaky gut test, you may be okay. But you, you know, I'm in agreement. Get rid of the sugar, get rid of the sugar because the sugar just doesn't do anything. And especially for parents, right? That have ADHD children, that just kind of runs them up, right? Yeah. Let me give, can I get, so again, like being practical is my superpower. Go for so it. I think everyone, probably everyone listening is like, yeah, sugar's bad, but like, it tastes so good. I can't stop. So just a couple of practical tips to like tighter down the sugar because absolutely for, yeah, for many people to say, like, if we say never eat sugar again, that's what Katie and Dan say. They're like, yeah, like, okay, like they might try it, but most people crash and burn if they just try to go cold turkey. Um, so I like to recommend like slowly trying to cut it out, like first start with awareness. Mm -hmm. So my first step with everyone is like, okay, like don't make any changes today. That like freaks out our brains. Just walk into your pantry and start reading labels, start looking and right. figuring out where the sugar is. There's so much sugar in things like spaghetti sauce, you know, the packaged granola bars, like places that aren't desserts. There's a lot of sugar and a lot of sugar in like low fat salad dressings. So figure out where it's sneaking up on you. Right. And talk yourself this. into seeing that as the enemy. That's so get your brain in the right spot is step one. And then, and then just start to look for opportunities. If you're making homemade muffins, yeah. try a quarter cup sugar less. <laughs> right. Right. If you're making homemade, try to find like the Aldi brand, um, spaghetti sauce doesn't have sugar in it. So that's, again, mm. it's a super easy swap. The good news is, I think the message of hope is that when you do, when you do start eating less sugar, your palate changes, mm -hmm. child or adult, you can mm -hmm. absolutely retrain your palate to appreciate like the finer points of real food. Okay. So like, for example, uh, my husband and I, we used to make homemade yogurt, but then we'd add a quarter cup of sugar to the quart mm -hmm. and vanilla and sweeten it ourselves. So we just started going less and less and less. less. And then like, I have this trick where I put a little honey on a spoon mm -hmm. and try to like, keep it there. If, does that make sense? So I like, like I'll get right. the yogurt off the spoon and just like, i like a hint of honey and the honey kind of stays on the spoon the whole time. Cause it's real thick. Right. Um, and eventually, and this took probably two years. I am to the point now and have been for a decade where I eat plain yogurt with just some frozen fruit, a little bit of frozen fruit on top. I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, you just add yeah, a little yeah. fruit, right? It tastes like ice cream now. I, I'm right. not deprived. I don't feel like I'm missing anything. Now, do I still like to eat ice cream? Yeah, I still have a sweet tooth, but I I know how to control it. You know, I know how to curb it back. Um, so that's just just learning where the sugar is sneaking up on you mm -hmm. and figuring out how to dial it back, mm -hmm. dial it back, have a little less, you know, and yeah, things like fresh fruits, dried fruits, and just even even something like roasting your vegetables. Mm -hmm. instead of sauteing or steaming roasting is going to caramelize the edges to give your give your tongue more of like um a, a, a little of sweetness yeah a, a little something something as we say here in new jersey right yes and, and let me tell you something that is that is worth the price of admission for today is reading those labels because you would think that some of these foods are healthy because they may say on the box heart healthy or this healthy or that healthy and it's not, and you have to read those labels. And the other word 
that you said was deprived because people think if they have to give up something that's like a painful situation, there's this deprivation that's going on yeah, that's in your fun. brain, Katie. That's not fun, right? Right? And and you are sitting there and you're saying, well, I don't know if I want to deprive myself of this. But if you have that ice cream at night and then you're having your granola bar and then you're having this, then all of a sudden you just had all the sugar that's just been adding up all day long. And you wonder why you feel like you're fatigued. You got the brain fog and all of that sort of stuff. So I think that's great. Read those labels. So for all of the listeners today, read the labels, right? What else besides sugar should people avoid? Well, I, I love to talk about what we should embrace, not right. what we should avoid, but, it, but if you want like the second thing that I would avoid, it would be industrial oils. So your corn Ooh. oil, your soybean oil, they, they're, they're just, they're everywhere, unfortunately. So if you can start to avoid those, you're going to cook more from scratch. Um, but they're just so inflammatory. We, we know that, right. you know, we're not, they're, they're not really created for us. They, these oils have not been around to me. That's my litmus test. Like how long has a food been around? Is, is the human race like created to eat this, adapted to eat this, um, these industrial oils, you know, corn, corn, soybean, cottonseed, all these, mm. all these like <coughs> plants that are subsidized and, and well, they're um, all, they're all processed. They're all, they're, so they're all in the, uh, they're all processed, right? They're only ultra processed. And, um, boy, I remember my mother making the homemade spaghetti sauce. She used to get the extra virgin olive oil and she would just oh, yeah. pour it in. There was no sugar in there either, just a pinch of salt, just to, you know, yep. to give a little, to give a little zing. Yeah, I don't like, I don't like these oils in addition to, you know, they're just, they're just bad. They're just bad. So tell me, what else should we embrace then? What more should vegetables. we be doing? Yeah, my, I, more vegetables. I, I run to the vegetables. You look at so many diets out there, you get keto to vegan to paleo and you go, oh my gosh, like some of them are the polar opposite of each other, but almost everyone says vegetables are good for us, right? So it feels it feels like that's like the one ace card <laughs> that you can you can embrace. Um, and 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 embracing variety. Right. Too. Like it's not just about baby carrots every day. Woohoo, I got my veggies. Um, but I really like to encourage people to to try new things, try new vegetables, try new mm -hmm. ways, especially if you're working within the context of a family. Right. Everyone's got different preferences. You know, little kids are just learning how to eat. They're learning what they like even as even into teenagerdom and adulthood, we're, we're still developing this skill called eating. Right. And so, so serving vegetables in different ways, you know, we talked about roasting raw. Sometimes kids love a raw vegetable that they won't eat cooked or the reverse can be true. Um, so just, just trying different preparation methods is so key to mm -hmm. helping your kids understand that, oh, like there are actually lots of foods I like even though there are lots of foods that maybe aren't my favorite as well. Right, right, sure. Now, how did you introduce vegetables to your four kids? Because I'm lucky in that, yeah. So my oldest, Paul, he's about to turn 16 this month. Ah, get his driver's license, but- um, we, <laughs> Mom's we, not sleeping at night. <laughs> well, I'm not scared yet. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> he's very responsible, but we kind of made the shift into pretty hardcore healthy eating when he was like, two and three. And so it's easier when your kids are little there. You just not, how do you introduce it? It's just like, this is life. Yeah. Like, this is right. just the normal. And, and now if my kids were the ages, they are now six, nine, 12 and 15. And I was trying to make a shift. I'd be a little harder, right? It's harder to right. change your habits, but, but I, if you got little kids, I mean, you just make it the normal. Like I always said, my, <laughs> I had to train my in-laws a little bit, like, no, like don't give my 13 month old a sucker because he doesn't know what a sucker is. Right. He doesn't know what a sucker is. He doesn't know what he's missing, right? So the only right. thing you're doing by giving him a sucker is introducing him to the world of what he's about to miss. Like you're, you're gonna hurt him. Like, you know, because like the ground- How did that work like, out? How, sucker, how did that you know? work out? How, you know, how did that work out when you said that? Were they looking at you saying, huh, right? Because there's a, because <laughs> there's a different experience with food when it comes to that. Yes. Yes. It took, it definitely took a lot of training. Like each, I, I can look like my first child was 15 months when he had his first candy. Mm -hmm. Second child was 18 months. Mm -hmm. Third child was two and a half. Fourth child was over three. Like we got, we got better at holding back the candy so that they don't have to, they don't feel deprived. I think, I think for my in-laws, like watching the joy 
on my one-year-old's face when he ate raspberries. Like that was what finally clicked it. And I'm like, look, like raspberries are his suckers. Right. Because you know? it's, like, it's, it's a fruit, there's sugar, natural, right? And so- He thinks it's so, the best thing in the world. So I'm like, all you got, you just bring fruit. So like literally every family party we've had for 15 years, my mother-in-law is like, I'll bring the fruit. <laughs> because- <laughs> because because now your mother-in-law, now because now your mother-in-law is going to your husband and saying, I don't know about Katie, you know, and we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to talk about this, you know. <laughs> the kids can't have a Snickers bar or something like that. Snickers are out. Yeah. So just introducing them and making it the norm. Yeah. Right, right from the onset, I think is 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 extremely important. And they love to eat vegetables. Now, how do you handle it? If they're out and they got the peer pressure, you know, can of sugary cola, what happens then? This, I mean, this is the hardest. This is the hardest line to walk. Mm -hmm. um, I have conversations a lot with people about like, how do we create ownership for our kids? Because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the thing. Like, I don't want to control what my kids eat forever. Mm -hmm. Right. So unless, unless I want to be standing there behind them at the college dormitory, like serving their food or making their food, mm -hmm. like Yes, I want to control what they eat when they're one, two, and three, but that's got to that's gotta stop, right? So I always talk about a gradual release of responsibility, and we let our kids, we let our kids make choices very young. So for example, um, my youngest is six, but especially when he was like four and five, he'd say, can I have a dessert? Mm -hmm. And we allow the kids one sweet a day at any time. It can be mm -hmm. breakfast, which is a little bit avant-garde. And I'll say, yeah, you know, and, and he might have like, maybe he has a big package of M&Ms from somewhere. How many can I have? And when they're about, you know, when they're two or three, like I would give them, well, when they're two or three, they don't know what candy is yet. Right. So now he's like, he's four or five or he's six. Smart. And maybe I would give him like 10 or something. So when he was five, I'd say, well, how many do you think is, is an appropriate dessert for a five-year-old? Do you think five because you're five? And that usually gets it. Oh yeah. I think five. Right. Like, do you know how much of a win that is for a five-year-old to choose five M&Ms for himself over the whole That day? is, that is a grand slam at that point, because usually they want five bags, yeah. right? Five, five, you know, because once they start, right, they're sitting there, they're watching, you know, their favorite show and they start snacking and, and then they'll just go. Yeah. So that's part of it is where we train self-control and we train moderation from the get-go. Right. So, so not right. restricting a food's important because if you completely restrict, then when they get out in those situations where they have their own spending money or they're, you know, they have the peer pressure, they're, you know, I call it the rubber band effect, right? If you completely restrict something, you pull them back. And then when you're not there, put wing. Yeah, they yeah. They shoot all the way into, you know, binging. So step one is don't restrict. Step two is begin to give them choices, even very, mm -hmm. very young. But just make those choices, you know, you can say, would you like five M&Ms or five Skittles? <laughs> right? right. They still have choices, but it's, you know, moderation. It's controlled. Um, it's controlled, especially at a young yep. age. I love and that. And then once, they're, once their logic is forming, right, they're above the age of reason, they're above seven or eight or nine, they're getting into elementary school, then, then I go science geek on my kids. And I start to drip out little facts about how sugar <laughs> hurts us, right? Mm -hmm. And I try to ask them, well, how does your body feel when you, you know, when you overdo it? It's, I, I kind of want my kids to overdo it a little bit when they're about 10, 11, 12, 13. So they know like, oh, that felt like crud. Yeah. And I, I didn't feel good doing that. So yeah. now, now what you've done is you made that association between eating something that you shouldn't be eating with feeling bad. Mm -hmm. I love that also. We hope. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge process. It's an 18 year process, right? It's an 18 year process. I'm at year 15 <laughs> and, and. <laughs> So far, so good. I think, I mean, my oldest is a boy, Paul. He probably, he probably eats a little too much sugar, mm -hmm. but it's one of those things where I'm not going to say like, no, I'm taking control back because mm -hmm. it just won't work. Well, they're going to do the opposite because they're teenagers. Exactly. So, you exactly. know, you can't, you just, you just, you just can't lay down the law when it, when it comes to that, especially with food, right? Because yeah. if you put, if you put the, if you put the broccoli on the table, I'm not eating this, mom. You didn't let me eat my five Skittles. So now I'm going to show you what's <laughs> going on. That is a great strategy. What are some other strategies that you've used for your children to help them out with the eating? You know, getting them involved yes. in the kitchen. That's, that's the superpower right there. That's supercharging the whole system. Because when, 
The kids are involved this. in the kitchen. There's, there's so much science there. First of all, they're getting exposed to a food with no pressure to eat it. So particularly if you've got a picky eater, getting the kids in the kitchen involved with the food is dynamite mm -hmm. because when they get to the table, they're, they're kind of stressed. They have stress on their shoulders because they feel like someone's going to make them eat something. Mm -hmm. When you're in the kitchen, no stress. So they get that exposure to that food, the smells, and hopefully they lick their fingers. That's gross, but if you got a picky eater, it's worth it. Um, you know, they get, they get exposed to the food. And then we're, we're human beings. We like to finish what we start, right? We have this open loop. Yeah. And so when kids are involved in the cooking, they're more likely to want to try the food and want to eat it. Um, yeah, they're taking ownership. Yeah, taking ownership. And so that's sustainability, right? Like I can teach my kids to eat vegetables, but if they don't know how to prepare them for themselves, it all falls apart when they turn 18 and leave the house. So I'm, we're, we're kind of building, we're building that capability where they know how to do it for themselves. They feel invested in the meal. Mm -hmm. um, and that, yeah, they're definitely more likely to eat it. My, my kids generally will eat not anything, not all of them, but right. on any given meal, they're for sure going to have a, a good balance because that's right. what we serve, you know, and right. that's just the normal for us. So we, we touched upon this in our first uh, podcast. Go over just a little bit. How old were they when they first started to cook? Because I find this fascinating. Yeah, well, I, um, I love the Montessori system myself coming from a, a teaching perspective. And Montessori uh -huh. is, is very much a proponent of getting tools in kids hands they call it practical life skills and uh -huh. so as a young mom to me that was like part of my job was to get the tools in the kids hands so we have this great little picture of my son paul he's less than two and he's cutting up cooked potatoes with a cheese knife it looks like a cleaver so it's kind of a scary picture but it's a cheese <laughs> knife <laughs> it's just like well he's small any cheese. any any knife is gonna look like a hatchet right when you, when you take it but it was, you know, it's dull. And he was cutting up cooked potatoes for potato salad. So I have, I definitely know for sure before the age of two, my kids are getting their hands in there. Wow. That is, that is, that is quite amazing. Now, Paul's 15. Yeah. Does he still participate mm -hmm. in the food cooking? He, he's busy, you know, he, you know, he got all the sports going on now. So is he, um, is he, uh, uh, is he still participating in, in, in cooking food? He is. Yeah. Paul and Leah both uh, work together, collaborate to make a meal once a week. And they've been doing that for three years. So they were nine and 12 when they started. Um, and yeah, he does. And he, um, he actually, I love what Paul says. He likes chopping vegetables because it feels therapeutic. Really? He does. Yeah. Did you ever ask him what that meant for him? Yeah. I mean, I think he says he just likes, he likes that like repetition. He likes being able he, to, he's a guy, he's got a knife in his hand and he's just, and he's just chopping things up at that point. Yeah. Well, when, it, when he's done, he's done. It's funny to watch them collaborate because my daughter is the planner. She'll mm -hmm. tell him what time he needs to show up at the kitchen and what he should do when, and he's just like, I'm just chopping veggies. I'm happy on her birthday. He worked with his younger brother to make dinner. And at the end he was like, so frazzled. He said, I really, I really missed having Leah there. I didn't know, I didn't know how to organize my time. Right. So we have a, we have a comment here. Uh, Andrea Mars has indicated that her son was in Montessori from two and a half years old to fourth to fourth grade, and she loved it. He's twenty one now, and he's in college. My son also went to Montessori. Aww. He's seeing not, he's seeing now how not eating the way he ate is affecting him, and he's decided to rein, uh, rein in. Uh, and, and get cleaner with, uh, with his eating because of the way he was eating before. So that's good. So, yeah. all right, Andrea, we're going to have to get your son into the kitchen stewardship so that he can, uh, he can, uh, he can, he can, he can learn a little bit more. You mentioned the word planning. Do you do a lot of meal prepping, a lot of planning? Is there like a day of the week that, you know, the Kimball family kind of gets together and it's like, um, you know, for the next four hours, we're going to list, listen to Andrea, you know, Andrea Bocelli, and we're going to make some nice Italian food. <laughs> that not that a lovely thought? I am just not that organized. <laughs> I would, I would love myself on Thursday and Friday if my Sunday self would do that. <laughs> but my Sunday self always has other things to do. So I do, I meal plan usually like on the back of an envelope, <laughs> it's just, you know, I write down, but I always, I always know, I always know what's going to happen for dinner at least a day before. Ideally, 
ideally it's a week, right? But but again, like I'm I'm growing, and the the more the better you get at cooking, the less perfect you have to be in the planning. Um, but that's been that has been interesting for my kids on the meal on the kids cooking night because they've had to learn to plan ahead and they, you know, that's upper brain level executive functioning. Their brains aren't fully right. really grown yet. <laughs> so it has been very challenging. Um, there was one time they, they're constantly just thawing the meat at like 4 PM. You know? <laughs> and so one day they made um, homemade meatballs and they're having like ground turkey and ground beef and stuff. And mm-hmm. my son made up all the meatballs and then he's walking around going, I can't feel my fingertips. Because, you know, it was only partially thawed, you know, you get to the middle and it's like, right, right. so frozen. So they, after that day, they got a lot better <laughs> at thawing meat the night before. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I always, I always tell people you can meal plan a month, you can meal plan a week, but at least meal plan one day ahead. Right. Try you to like try yourself to, better. <clears throat> yeah. You know what, in, in our household, we, you know, Sunday at some point in time, there's some cooking going on. Because if you don't meal plan for a couple of few days, that's when you fail too, right? Because life is busy, right, Katie? And what can happen, that's when you're like driving and you're like, you know what? I have nothing at the house. There's the pizzeria. And let's go to the pizzeria. And next thing you know it, you're like, oh, geez, this is good. That one (laughs) slice turns to two. Two slices turns to three. And you might as well have the soda that's there because... There's no water or anything like that there because that's just the way, that's just the way it goes when it comes to that, right? So I plan to fail. That's actually my strategy is I know that I will have a day where I haven't meal planned. Right. So I plan for the failure. And what do you do for that? Yeah. Like what the heck does that mean? (laughs) That means that there's always some easy food in my house that still is within the realm of acceptable as right. far as ingredients, right? So maybe some good organic sausages or, you know, there's always bacon, there's always eggs. So I, I have this like list, I have this like category in my head of what are my oh crap meals? <laughs> you know, it's 5 p.m. oh crap. <laughs> right. I didn't plan or, you know, you, a lot of times you get back from vacation and you're tumbling into the house with all the luggage at like 6.30 p.m. and you're like, oh no. Right. But I, I always have, something in the freezer I can There's pull something. out, some sausages, some eggs. Like I, I can create a meal in half an hour with the help of my family if I need to. So I don't, I honestly do not know the last time that we pulled the, like, I literally have nothing to eat. We have to go out. Right. Right. We don't have, we don't have that emergency button because I have other emergency buttons in my house, right. That I've already planned for that are within the realm of acceptable. So there's always something in there just in case of that emergency. And you have the whole family helping out. You know what? My wife threw me out of the kitchen one day and she said that you're just too messy to be in my kitchen, she said. And I looked at her and I said, I think that you don't like me cooking better than you, honey. And I think that she got a little, she got a little mad at me and, um, but that's okay. I still, I still, I still jump in there and I, and I cook, you know, I, I don't, I don't mind making breakfast and dinner. I'm not a, I'm not a lunchy type of a guy that makes something, you know, I like something quick. I just have a nutrition shake or something like that. Mm. So your husband's involved in this too, right? This is a whole family affair. He's learned, he has learned to cook. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he, (laughs) the, the famous story is that when I married him, he didn't know where the stamps were to, to mail a letter in the house that he'd lived for 20 years. So that's where we were starting from. <laughs> he'd, he'd never made spaghetti <laughs> until he was 21 years old. Um, but now, no, he's a very good cook. He takes a couple meals, uh, dinners a week, actually, just because he saw my stress levels raising mm-hmm. and he's like, we got to figure something out here. So you, you are, you are really doing, you know, valuable work here. And this is important teaching children and teaching people how to cook. You know, and you say it right here to be frugal, environmentally friend, friendly, eating real food and without losing sanity when it when it when it comes to eating, because people stress over food. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, geez. People just stress. What are we eating tonight, honey? Or what are we doing? We going out? We're going in. What are we staying in? When you go out to dinner, what do you normally do? If for us? Yes. Um, Pretty much. I mean. When we go out, so we do a couple of things. Usually my husband and I will skip the bread. 
So like, we'll get a beautiful burger with lots of toppings and just say no mm-hmm. bun. And I mm-hmm. figure that's like, it's better. Um, right. But you know, I mean, we go out so seldomly that we usually, we just let our kids order whatever they want because, mm-hmm. because again, I don't want them to feel too restricted. We, we tend to poo poo the kid's menu especially once they're over like seven or eight. So we try to encourage our kids to like- Chicken fingers and French fries, right? It's chicken fingers and French fries that they want at that point. Yeah, yeah, pizza, grilled cheese. You know, it's just all these different renditions of cheese and bread (laughs) on the kid's menu. Right. Um, And usually, I mean, I think all of our kids have sort of grown. They, at first they're like so excited. They love the kid's menu because it's stuff that we don't cook, right? It's new and novel. And then after a couple disappointing meals, where they're like, I didn't taste as good as I thought. They, they start to look at the adult plates that are so much more colorful. They're so beautiful and lots of flavor. And so they, they kind of come into their own where they're like, oh, I kind of want to order off the adult menu. And then we just right. again, try to get them to like split a meal and you don't end up spending anymore. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So when you work with kids, how young do you work with them in the kitchen stewardship? For, well, kitchen stewardship is where I teach adults, but kids cook real food. We start them as, as young as right. two. Wow. That's just amazing. And, and you know what? For, for all of our listeners today, we're going to try to set aside a Saturday or maybe a Friday night or, I don't know, maybe a breakfast for a Sunday. And we're going to cook a healthy meal and we're going to have our kids cook it for us. And we're going to have Katie go through all of this to show you exactly what she does. Cause I think that this is amazing. I think that this is vitally important. These are life skills that you can not only, you know that you're gonna use now, but you can take with you when you go to college or you get your first apartment and you've got your first job and that you're yeah. eating healthy and you're really changing the world now, aren't you? Because once they do this, once the kids do it and then they teach their kids and then they're teaching their kids, you're changing the world one pepper at a time. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the goal. Yeah. It, you know, you caught me off guard with the eating out question because we just spent nine days on spring break vacation. We didn't see the inside of a restaurant once. Right. We, so like, that's not our normal. Right. <laughs> so we don't even hardly have a system. We just, e- eating out is like a totally a treat for my kids. And so that's their normal. Right. You go on vacation and you still cook. And you still and you still do the cooking. And the reason why I ask that is because so many people during this pandemic, they don't want to cook. They're in the house. They're busy. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, working from home. Let's order that pizza. Let's do that. And I wanted to see what you did. I thought I think that was a learning tool. It was important to sit there and say, "Listen, we don't go out and eat. You know, that's not our jam. That's not what we do. Even when we go, you know, away on vacay." you know, we're still, we're still cooking, you know, you know, when we go away on vacation, there's one night that we go out and we make sure that we're eating healthy as much as you can going out, but we're going to cook at home in addition to, yeah. because I, I love to get the piece of salmon and, and some grass fed beef or whatever it is and the veggies. And I go on the grill and I, you know, and I, I do what I got to do, you know, to cook that up because it's just so much better for you. And you save money because you like to be frugal too, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I felt really good just shopping at, at the grocery store, right? We we went to Sprouts. We went to Aldi, planned it all out. And my daughter was amazing, Dan. She's 12. And like, <laughs> I'm like sitting at the pool, like, oh, I don't want to go cook. She goes, mama, help. So she helped just about, just about every meal with the terrible knives, <laughs> the terrible, not sharp knives. I thought we were going to kill ourselves. <laughs> Oh, it was so unsafe, but we, I mean, we ate tons of veggies and my husband was able to stay keto. He lost two pounds on vacation. And that's impossible to do, to lose two pounds on vacay, right? He never felt deprived once he said. So that's, that's a testament right there to like, you don't have to feel deprived. And I mean, I'm at, I'm at a certain level, right? I've been doing this for a really long time, but that's why you start young. Cause we, Mm -hmm. we don't want to have to learn and drink from the fire hose at age 20 or 21. 18 or whatever it is we want to we want to be able to teach our kids like here's how you measure a teaspoon of salt Mm -hmm. when you're four you know here's how you measure flour I I like to break things down into simple skills simple steps simple baby steps but then once you've done that for a number of years you know so much 
Right, sure, 100%. Tell us about the cookbooks. Oh, they're, I mean, they're all self-published. I'm not, I'm not fancy at all, um, but I like to, <laughs> I like to share, I like to share just like really family friendly recipes. Mm -hmm. So the first one was healthy snacks to go. Um, it's just that idea of like, I need a snack and I open the cupboards and all I see is right. ingredients. <laughs> all you I see, eat? all you see is a chocolatey, chocolatey candy bar or chocolate uh cookie a chocolate cakey type of a thing that's no i don't because with... i don't buy those yeah we and that's and that's the point is is you don't but a lot of people when they do right they open that up boy i used to love that when i was younger but not anymore because you know <laughs> I, it's, it's just not healthy and it doesn't taste good to me anymore either by the way right so. yeah because you do you shift you shift your you taste shift. buds so yeah, it's, I, I love to show people how to cook healthy foods mm -hmm. that taste really good, you know, that are still family friendly. So I, I do a lot of like reverse engineering saying to people, well, what's a, what is a food you like, you know, that you would go out and eat out? Well, let's, right. let's make that at home. And here's how you can do that. Right. So you're using the psychology of, of being a teacher and you're, and you're using it on children and adults, it sounds like. So I love that. That's all, that's all good. Now we're almost done with our time. What are the three tips that you would give somebody if they were first to meet you and you were going to tell them about healthy cooking and healthy eating? What are, what are the top three tips you would, you, you would give? Oh, it is always hard to distill <laughs> down to three. Um, well, I got to throw a curveball once or twice during the, uh, yeah, during yeah, the interview. yeah. Well, right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say, I would say, figure out your personality, right? Because mm -hmm. that's step one is some mm -hmm. people, and my husband is one of these needs to be all or nothing. So if he's eating sugar, he's, he's going to end up eating too much. Mm -hmm. So he tends to go to nothing, right? Mm -hmm. For some people that like freaks out their brain and they're just going to give up on their goals. So some right. people have to, you know, work it backwards. So I, that's step one, honestly, is think mm -hmm. about think about what is going to work for you. Mm -hmm. I'd say step two is stop buying things you don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we kind of just touched on that, but like, if you buy it, what did I read? Someone say, somebody said, I am not stronger than the cookie in my house, but I have legs and the cookie does not. You're right. <laughs> cookie uh, cannot I walk into my house. So you do need to like make a commitment to be strong in the grocery store or shopping on Instacart on your phone, however you get food, mm -hmm. don't let food into your house that you don't want to eat. I think that's important. I think that is really important because, you know, when you're shopping, you know, we're, we are, um, how can I say it? We're like conditioned to just start throwing things in our cart. So you go down a particular aisle and you just start throwing things into your cart, right? Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. Go to the periphery, get those veggies. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and, and I guess that's, that would be number three is just find one recipe that you think your family would like, like just one, like there's start somewhere. You just got to start somewhere. Yeah, right. Start somewhere. Yeah. I love that. So where can people find you? You know, I think this is, I think this is, um, you know, this is very unique. Your niche is very unique and I love it. And it is extremely important. You're teaching people how to cook healthy. I mean, that is amazing. I love that. So where can people find you? Yeah, this is more important than ever. Um, kitchenstewardship.com, that, that's where I'm gonna help adults, right? We, uh -huh. we dig into a lot of research, what's healthy, what's not, how do you even figure it out? How do you take those baby steps? How do you do it without breaking the bank? Um, there, you can actually sign up for my series of Monday missions. That's how I started out is every Monday I would mm -hmm. give one new change for years. And so now we've taken like the top 10 of those and I'll send you an email every Monday for the rookies. This is one first is meal, plan. that would have been the first scratch, whatever I said, meal plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the most important thing. Cause if you plan a healthy meal, you're so much more likely to succeed. So meal planning is three B. <laughs> Or number four or whatever. Number four when you ask for three. <laughs> anyway, that's what we do. That's what we do. We send an email every every Monday. The first one is meal planning. Um, and then if you're if you have kids, if you want to teach your kids to cook, kidscookrealfood.com is where we do all that. We have them, we have a course and we have lots and lots of free resources as well. 
I, I, I love this. And we're going to, we, we're, we're going to, we're going to talk about a date in a few minutes when we get off to see if we can start figuring out a little bit, maybe it's after the school year, or, you know, whatever, but, but we're going to, we're going to discuss this because I think it would be interesting to, to show how you go through this and how your children are doing it. And then my son who's, who cooks, but geez, it's, you know, you go downstairs and it's, um, you know, a grilled cheese sandwich and stuff like that. And I'd say to him, buddy, is there anything else that you could have cooked? He was like, I like, I like grilled cheese, dad. And I'm like, stop. <laughs> so, so we're going to, we're, you know, we're going to figure that out. So I want to thank you for coming on today. It's always a great conversation talking with you and please for all of our listeners, share this with family, friends, neighbors, coworkers. This is important information. This is something vitally important. Kitchenstewardship.com and kicks, kids cook real food.com recommend that you contact Katie today to make sure that you start the process. So thank you very much, Katie. Thank you, Dan. I, I can't wait to see what it what happens when your 13-year-old boy gets to hang out live with my 16-year-old boy. I, I, I want to see some positive peer pressure there. That'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting to see how they're going to interact. And so we have to make sure that both of them are there that day. So it's going to be sure. great. So I want to thank everybody for coming in and listening to us today. I'm Dr. Dan. You find me at suburbanwellnessgroup.com or greenleafbewell.com. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Live the best versions of yourself. Until the next time, take care.